Here we have um, Geoff Bauer here. Uh, he did his, uh, he finished his PhD at UC Berkeley in 1997. Uh, he was a Jansky Fellow at NRAO, uh, and then back to Berkeley as an assistant professor, but has from 2014 been at the Academia Sinica uh, Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics, leading their operation in Hawaii, and from 2019 been the project scientist of, uh, of the Event Horizon Telescope. So uh, <clears throat> uh, let's hear what has come out of this after <laughs> uh, the four years we waited. So this is a talk that uh, that I can I can give where uh, we put the punchline uh, on the uh, on the very first slide on the introductory slide. I think uh, there's no doubt that uh, uh, all of you have uh, have probably seen these images uh, at this point. Our our communications people tell us that some three billion people in the world have uh, have seen these images or seen one of these images at least. Uh, but I'm going to tell you about how we came to make these images, uh, what the technology is behind it, what the, what the algorithms and techniques are behind it, and what we've learned from these images, and then where this field uh, is going next, to how it connects to the broader science of, uh, of black holes. So this is the image of, uh, uh, of the black hole in M87. It's the first image of a black hole. Uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the number or the fact that I would call to your attention here is this uh, ring diameter of 42 micro arc seconds. Uh, and it's really uh, very far from any, our, 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 our ability to think about this in, in human terms, but you can think of 42 micro arc seconds as about the size of an orange on the moon. Uh, as, uh, as viewed uh, from the Earth, or if you like, Neil Armstrong's toe uh, on the moon. And contained within that 42 micro arc seconds is six billion solar masses of, uh, of black hole. And we are constraining all of that mass to sit within this ring, which is about 10 uh, gravitational radii in diameter. Now, we now have two black holes that we have, oh, that we have imaged, and here is Sagittarius A star, uh, the black hole in the center of our galaxy with a, uh, uh, an angular diameter of 52 micro arc seconds, so only about 20% different from that of, uh, of M87. And this is one of these cosmic coincidences, a little bit like uh, the fact that solar eclipses occur because the angular diameter of the moon and the sun are the same uh, to, uh, to reasonable precision. Uh, in this case, the mass of Sagittarius A star is 4, 4 million solar masses, a factor of 1,500 less than that of uh, M87, but it's about a factor of 2,000 closer than, uh, than M87, and those factors roughly cancel, leaving us to have these two black holes with essentially the same diameter. And the, the image of Sag A star is particularly important because this is really our best studied black hole in the entire universe. Uh, and so we are able, what we learn from, uh, uh, from studying Sagittarius A star with the EHT, with the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, is really built up by the enormous uh, amount of work that is done through other techniques to study Sag A star. So uh, <laughs> uh, these, uh, these images are the, the images that have launched a thousand memes. Uh, <laughs> you can choose your favorite one. Uh, I, the one that I love best uh, is, is this. This is from the comic XKCD, uh, if any of you read that. Uh, and it's great just because it's, there's such nerd credibility and being cited in XKCD, but also because it's informative, right? That this, uh, this ring uh, in, uh, in M87 is on the scale of the outer, outer diameter of the solar system. So that's the, that's the kind of physical scale that we are, uh, we are working with here. Now, I really want to emphasize, and we've heard this from other speakers, how uh, the work that we do is, is the work of many uh, and that we, we build through successive generations. Uh, so the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration has 350 members uh, in it. 
Uh, we are a, 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 a large and growing collaboration. The work that we did on SAG A Star uh, that we published this year, nearly all of that has been done under the conditions of the pandemic. And so we have had lots of uh, uh, meetings that look something like this, where we have hundreds of people on, on Zoom telecons. Uh, and it is extremely challenging to get people to work together uh, under, those, uh, under those circumstances. It's really great to be uh, in the same room uh, as, as a bunch of people and be able to work together. We did act, get about a third of our collaboration together uh, earlier this summer uh, in Granada in Spain uh, for our first in-person collaboration meeting in almost three years. Um, so uh, we, got a, we got a really good uh, a discussion earlier uh, about the importance of black holes and the roles that, that black holes play in the, the history of the universe, the evolution of galaxies, uh, and, uh, and our basic understanding. I want to emphasize one other aspect of this, uh, and it's uh, encapsulated in, in, uh, in, this, in this phrase, black holes have no hair, which I, I, I believe originates from, uh, from John Wheeler, who's pictured up here. Uh, and uh, the, the, the fundamental point here is that black holes are extremely simple objects. They're described by their mass, their spin, and their charge. And as Andy uh, explained uh, earlier, we expect that electrical charge has, has, uh, uh, has no effect. But so mass and spin are the fundamental parameters of these, uh, of these objects. And we are in a position with the Event Horizon Telescope to test uh, that proposition to actually explore whether or not that is true and in a quantitative way. The other aspect of studying black holes that I, I really want to emphasize, and this is a, a long-term kind of view of, of the study of black holes, though, so black holes are where our two great theories of the universe meet. We have general relativity, which describes mass and the structure of the universe, and which predicts the existence of black holes. And then we have uh, quantum mechanics, which describes the very small, the atomic. And the, the surfaces of, uh, of black holes are really where these two theories collide. They are, fit, they are mathematically incompatible with each other. Uh, and, uh, and while I would not profess to say that we have made any progress on answering questions around that, this is the regime where uh, where we can pose questions uh, 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 about how those, those two worlds meet. And of course, uh, that is the work that Stephen Hawking was, was famous for in, in, and many others. So, um, my work is in radio astronomy. Uh, the Event Horizon Telescope makes images in radio astronomy. And we've seen today uh, a lot of what we can learn from optical astronomy on the study of stars and x-rays through the study of, uh, uh, of black holes. Uh, and really, uh, uh, you know, a fundamental aspect of all astrophysics is that, is that multi-wavelength views of, uh, of the universe are, are really essential. And I love this uh, uh, recent image from the, the James Webb Space Telescope of a, uh, of a deep extra, extra galactic field which reveals a couple of things. Uh, you know, first off, all of these objects, or nearly all the objects that you can see in this, uh, in this image uh, are galaxies, and many of them are, have black holes at their center that are, that are powering the emission from them. The other thing that you can see, that we're actually looking uh, through a cluster, uh, of, a very massive cluster of galaxies, you can see these, uh, these arcs, uh, these streaks that uh, that are in this image. Uh, this is gravitational lensing uh, uh, of background galaxies by this massive cluster of, uh, of galaxies. It's the exact same physics that's creating that ring uh, of light that we see in the Event Horizon Telescope images. It's the lensing of light by mass. Now, the, the, the geometries are uh, slightly different, but it's essentially the same thing. So this is a, a, a radio view of the sky made with the, the very large array, uh, and it looks quite different. It's not the same field, but uh, it doesn't really matter. This is what a deep radio image of the sky looks like. And it's dominated by these compact point-like objects. All of these are black holes, 
radio astronomy is extremely good uh, at, at finding black holes uh, in, the, uh, in the universe. And for nearby objects, uh, we, get these, uh, we get these beautiful uh, images. This is uh, Cygnus A. The black hole is sitting here. We have a uh, bipolar relativistic jet uh, that, uh, that flows out and collides with the, the intergalactic medium and creates these giant puffy lobes uh, that surround them. Now, M87, uh, which we've, we've shown you the EHT image, uh, is, uh, uh, has, has one of these jets. It was first seen in the optical over, uh, over a century ago uh, and not well understood at all at that point. It's been studied extensively at radio wavelengths, and as you go from low angular resolution, large-scale images, to higher angular resolution, you see that it's jets uh, all the way down, that uh, you get increasingly uh, a, a better resolution, but uh, we're still, uh, still jet-dominated in these systems. And one of the, one of the uh, I, I would say, one of the really great themes of, of today's uh, uh, presentations is also that the time variability of the universe and that the universe is are the systems that we are studying are variable on human time scales, and that also holds true for these jet systems. So these are, uh, this is a movie uh, over a course of uh, uh, a couple of hundred days of the, the jet feature in M87, the black hole is here, and, uh, and relative, gas is moving relativistically out of, uh, uh, away from the black hole uh, on, that, uh, on that time scale. So the, the image that, uh, images that I showed you from the Event Horizon Telescope rely on, uh, on a really fairly simple bit of, uh, of physics, and that is that light is bent by the, by the black hole. We heard about this from Aaron in, in how uh, you can see that show up in the, uh, in the echoes. Uh, in our case, we are directly imaging that, that effect, uh, and you can see the various... Uh, 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 lines of, 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 of motion that, that, that photons will follow, and that they get uh, directed out at, at essentially a constant impact factor that de is determined only by the mass of the black hole uh, and the spin of the black hole. And the spin tends to be a, a, a somewhat smaller effect, about a 10% uh, effect. Um, about 20 years ago, it was first predicted that, uh, that this was a detectable effect uh, for Sagittarius A star, and there were some simulations and that predicted uh, this, uh, this kind of shadow-like image uh, and the scale uh, of about 50 micro arc seconds. And that prediction really launched us uh, in, this, uh, in this direction of, of, uh, uh, of, of pursuing these images. Um, in the subsequent decades, there's been enormous growth in the ability to uh, make realistic physical models of accretion and outflow onto, uh, onto these systems. Uh, and you might pay attention to, to the model here at the wavelength, for a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters. But what, what you really want to see in this, right, is that the ring is a persistent uh, feature uh, in all of these cases, regardless of the state of the system at any given particular time. Um, the system has to be optically thin in order for you to see it. The ra at radio wavelengths, it tends not to be at millimeter wavelengths, tends to be uh, uh, observable. Uh, and so regardless, really, of the detailed physics of how the accretion works, uh, we have a very stable feature that we can, we can predict and we can detect. All right, so let me say a little bit about the techniques uh, and the requirements associated with, uh, with making these measurements. So we do interferometry. Uh, in order to achieve an angular resolution on the scale of tens of micro arc seconds, we actually need a telescope with a, an effective diameter uh, around the diameter of the Earth. Uh, we operate at the shortest wavelength that we can, where it's the highest angular resolution. We'd be very happy if the funding agencies allowed us to panel the entire Earth with, uh, with aluminum panels and, and build a, a, an enormous telescope. But 
and until that day happens, we will do interferometry and we'll use small telescopes distributed around the world to synthesize a telescope that has that angular resolution. Uh, there's no existing array, or there was no existing array to, to do this when we started out, and so we had to create our own ad hoc network out of, uh, out of existing facilities that were not necessarily built for this purpose. This is a challenging uh, wavelength regime to work in from the ground. Uh, most locations on the Earth uh, are terrible locations for doing millimeter astronomy. You need to be very high, very dry, uh, the summit of Mauna Kea, uh, the South Pole, the Atacama Desert in Chile, uh, in order to escape the absorption uh, in the atmosphere, and also to minimize turbulent uh, effects uh, as water vapor, clouds blow through and distort uh, our, our signal. So here's one of the telescopes that uh, is located in, in, uh, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, the submillimeter array, this is an interferometer in itself, which we combine the signals from to have it operate as a signal, single telescope and then connect with the rest of the telescopes. Now, the other thing that, that is, a, is a major challenge for us and that we have overcome is that uh, the sources we're looking at are faint uh, and our telescopes, in some sense, are not that sensitive. Uh, and uh, there have been two major... Uh, uh, steps that we've been able to take in order to overcome that sensitivity. And the first is in recording the data. We collect the, we record the, 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 the real-time electric field as it comes into each station. The more bandwidth you, that you collect, the more sensitive you are. Um, and so the history of recording fo has followed a kind of a Moore's Law progression from the late 60s when very long baseline interferometry, interferometry was invented. I joined the field in, in the, in the mid-90s, uh, and we were using these kind of reel-to-reel -reel tape systems, and every two hours you had, to, you had to get up and change the tape and thread it through, and it was very nerve-wracking to do this because there was, you had six minutes to do this in between scans and, and, uh, and get it right. Uh, kids these days have it easy. We just have disk drives that we plug in, and they and they and they run continuously for a week. We use commercial off-the-shelf disk uh, disk drive systems now, but we record data at a rate of 64 gigabits per second from each of the stations that are a part of our array, and we run a we run campaigns that last for about 10 days, and the um, we generate petabytes of data which is equivalent to something like 100,000 high-definition movies uh, that we record. We, it is an enormous volume of data, but that really drives our, our, our sensitivity. The other um, major driver in sensitivity has been the introduction of the ALMA telescope uh, in, in Chile. The ALMA telescope is the, the, the largest millimeter, submillimeter radio telescope ever built and it has really transformed our sensitivity. So this is uh, Alma down here, and you see uh, all of the other uh, telescopes scattered around uh, the globe that participated in our, uh, our 2017 campaign. And you see how we uh, have the, the, the maximum dimension that, uh, that, that, that we can in order to get the highest angular resolution that we need. So, uh, now we get to the Fourier transforms. Uh, and uh, so each antenna pair uh, forms what we call a baseline. And each antenna pair, each baseline, is measuring a Fourier component uh, of the brightness distribution on the sky. So you take your, your picture up here on the wall and you Fourier transform that, and there's some distribution. And we're sampling that at individual locations in the, in the Fourier plane here. We don't have complete sampling because we don't have measurements everywhere. But we use the fact that as the Earth rotates and the source sits in the same position on the sky uh, to build up a different set of, uh, of Fourier components. And then we have uh, a set of different algorithms, um, both established and, and, and new algorithms to do that inverse Fourier transform, to go from the, the data that we collect in the Fourier uh, domain and build that up uh, into, uh, into an image. 
Um, and I'm going to come back to this uh, in, in a little bit more detail because uh, I, I really want to convince you that we, we, <laughs> we know what we're doing when we make an image out of this, uh, out of this incomplete data. But first, let's, let's talk a little bit about the galactic center. So here's a beautiful uh, optical infrared image uh, of, the, uh, of the galactic center. Uh, Sagittarius A star, the black hole, lives inside of this uh, star cluster that's, uh, that's located here. And as I, I think you're all aware, um, uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez two years ago received the Nobel Prize for their work in studying the, uh, uh, the motions of stars in the galactic center. And that work is so exquisite that it measures the mass and the distance to Sagittarius A star to a precision of better than 1%. And that precision is so important for us because the, the shadow diameter that we predict uh, for our measurements is simply determined by the ratio of mass to distance. So if you want to ask yourself, is the theory of general relativity correct? Does, do, do black holes have hair? You need a really accurate estimate to compare against. Uh, and, uh, and, and the exquisite measurements from Genzel and Gez uh, uh, provide that standard in a way that we don't get for M87, where there's a factor of two uncertainty uh, in mass estimates from gas and stellar dynamic studies uh, of, uh, of the galaxy. So now let me give you the, 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 a view of, the, uh, of what the galaxy looks like at radio wavelengths. Uh, these are large-scale radio images, uh, and then we're zooming into the galactic center, and you can see that it is full uh, of all kinds of structures. Uh, this is a giant supernova remnant. Uh, this is something called the mini-spiral ga ionized gas that's flowing in towards the black hole. And then as we go into smaller and smaller scales, uh, we get to... Uh, our, our EHT scale. But one of the things I really want to, I, I, I want to impress on you from this, right, is that we are not in the same situation that, that Andy was describing for 3C273, where it's 100, uh, you know, where it's 10 trillion times brighter than a, than a star. Sagittarius A star is really kind of hidden in our galactic center. It is a very low accreting uh, uh, black hole. It's underluminous by a factor of about a billion uh, off of what its, what its potential is. There are individual solar mass stars in our galaxy that are accreting gas more rapidly than this black hole is. So in some ways, it's uh, the cowardly lion of the, uh, of the, of the galaxy. It's really a, a, a very inactive black hole, but which turns out to be quite beneficial for us. So how do we go about actually making this image? Um, so this is, what, this is what the best uh, imaging data on Sagittarius A star looked like uh, uh, about a decade ago or 15 years ago. This is from a three baseline uh, interferometric experiment that we carried out. And these are, these are those Fourier measurements that are obtained on, uh, on, the, different, uh, on the different baselines. And, well, you can't make an image with this data. All you can do is fit a model to it. And really, you can, the only model you can fit to this is the simplest thing that, that, that you can think of, which is a Gaussian. You fit a Gaussian source, and you, the Fourier transform is a, of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. You draw some lines through there, and you say, well, that's about the size uh, of, uh, of this object. Uh, and we did this experiment, and we were like, wow, look, it's you know, a few Schwarzschild radii in diameter, and so that's pretty compelling evidence. But that's not an image that's quite far from an image. This is what our 2017 data look like in that same space, the visibility amplitude, that Fourier component amplitude, as a function of the, uh, uh, of the baseline length. And now we have a lot of really rich information here. Now, as physicists, uh, as, as astronomers who are familiar with Fourier transforms. I'm going to convince you that, uh, that this does, in fact, image into a, a ring. 
uh, and that this is, uh, you know, what you're seeing is not the ar an artifact of some reconstruction technique. Right, so what are the salient features that you see here? Well, you see the, you see the amplitude falling off, uh, coming to a minimum, and then rising again, and then coming to another minimum, and then rising again, and doing that. That looks like a Bessel function. Uh, what is the Fourier transform of a Bessel function? It's a, it's a ring or it's a disk. It's something with sharp edges associated with it. Um, you can distinguish between whether or not it's a ring or a disk based on the, the ratio of, um, uh, of the position of these two nulls. Uh, so that a, uh, a disk would have, a, have its second null at a, at a longer baseline than, uh, than, than what we have with, uh, with, a, uh, with a thin ring. And we can measure uh, the diameter uh, of that ring just by finding this particular null. Now the other thing that you'll see in this is that, uh, and you're probably sitting there saying, well, Jeff, some of that data looks like it fits to the null, but not all of it looks like it fits to the null, right? It's more complicated than that, right? These data points are sitting at the location of that null, but they're not at, at, a, at a minimum value. That tells us that, that, we have a, that we have a source with more structure. They're, they're, they're measuring uh, structure in one dimension, uh, whereas the other baselines are measuring structure in a, in a different dimension. And it turns out that, um, that for, for M87, we had a much cleaner case. And the real challenge with Sagittarius A star has been that this is more complex data. And it's more complex for two reasons. One is that there's probably some additional structure. And two is that Sagittarius A star uh, is time variable. Um, and that's because it's lower mass than, than M87. It's 1,500 times lower in mass, which means the linear scales are 1,500 times smaller, and then the time scales are 1,500 times smaller. So here's a simulation, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic sim simulation, and you can see just how much more rapidly Sag A star evolves. We can do this again. Uh, Right, M87 is changing uh, over, this, uh, over this time scale, right? You can see small features changing. But M87 changes on a time scale of about 100 days. Uh, Sagittarius A star has a characteristic time scale of tens of minutes to hours. We're making an image as the Earth rotates on a time scale of 8 to 12 hours. So the, the, the source itself may be changing on a time scale faster than, than we are making an image of it. And that introduced an enormous amount of complexity into, uh, into our analysis techniques. Um, oh, I just heard the champagne car. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, OK, so here's the actual evidence uh, um, that, uh, that of, of variability uh, of the light curve of, uh, uh, of Sag A star during the course of our observations, during about uh, the 10 hours over which we were observing, and you can see the brightness going up and down. Uh, and, uh, and so we know that there's variability. We actually developed a number of techniques for, uh, uh, for mitigating this variability or understanding its impact uh, on our data, which I don't have time to, to, to get into now. Um, and we did a, a, a huge amount of, uh, of modeling to explore uh, all the different kinds of, uh, of sources that might possibly fit uh, the data that we have. And we're very confident uh, that a ring-like model is, is the best model. Uh, but there is a, there, these, these models down, that you see down here, or images that you see at the bottom here, these are different modes uh, of all the different kinds of images that we made. Uh, and, uh, and you can see there are variations among them. They're all kind of similar. There are a handful of modes of, of imaging the source that are not ring-like. So at the 1% level, I can say there is a little uncertainty. Maybe it's not a ring. But uh, everything that we did really pointed to, to it being ring-like. Now, the other thing I want to say, and I, a lot of people ask about this, is you know, what do, these, what do these three bright spots mean? They don't mean anything. These are artifacts uh, of our technique, 
and they are really limitations due to the lack of, of, of information that we have because we have very limited uh, information about uh, in, the, in the UV domain and, and with, the, with the changing, uh, uh, potentially changing source structure. Okay, so now I want to turn to the interpretation uh, of these results. And uh, um, we generated an enormous library uh, of theoretical models to, uh, to compare against uh, our, our observations. Um, and so we, uh, we, search, uh, we generated a, a wide range of uh, spins, inclination angles, uh, individual properties of the uh, properties of the electrons, magnetic field uh, models. Uh, it's really kind of mesmerizing to uh, to watch these all go around. You see a lot of similarities. Uh, you also see some differences here. Uh, so we're we're not running an insane asylum. Uh, there, this, these are terms of art in the field. Mad and sane. Mad is magnetically arrested disk, and sane is standard and normal evolution. Uh, uh, some clever people in the field. Uh, so then we're able to uh, apply various uh, observational constraints uh, uh, against these models and test whether, whether in fact, they, um, uh, they fit. And so uh, the, the, the rough size, the, the circular shape, and the, and the details of, of, of that image are very constraining. Broad spectral features, uh, the X-ray emission, the near-infrared emission are constraining. Lower frequency measurements of the size are constraining. Um, it's either embarrassing or awesome, but none of the models fit all of the, the, the observational constraints. In my view as an experimentalist, it's awesome. Uh, because we're really, we're, that means we're really pushing the theory. It means that, that what we're doing, you know, because as, uh, uh, as uh, someone said earlier, you know, the star is right uh, and, the, you know, the theory has to, uh, has to catch up. In particular, uh, it turns out that the degree of variability uh, is, one of the, is one of the strongest constraints uh, and, uh, and, is, uh, uh, and is one of the most difficult to, uh, to satisfy. But generically, what we, what we get from uh, these results is that we really, I, we pretty strongly exclude a, a, an edge-on system. The, the system is face-on to some degree, so uh, it's not necessarily the case that it's pointing directly at us, uh, but it's face-on to, uh, to some degree. Uh, it's a mad system. Uh, there's probably positive spin associated with it. Uh, and 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 low electron temperatures, but uh, but really, I think we're sending the, the the theorists back to the drawing board in terms of their their simulations. Now, the other area where we've done a where we've done a lot of work is in uh, comparing our results against the theory of general relativity against the Kerr metric, um, and this is a uh, this is a phase space diagram. Uh, of, uh, of a wide range of different measures that are used in the study of, uh, of general relativity. So you have gravitational potential. This is basically the, 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 the velocity uh, of, uh, of whatever you're studying uh, relative to the speed of light. And then there's curvature, uh, how curved is the space-time. Uh, and so there are solar system tests, uh, which we've heard about before. There's cosmological tests. There's uh, merging neutron stars and merging black holes that fill this space. And we fill a unique parameter space here, a very high gravitational potential, not the same curvature, not as strong a curvature as, as the LIGO uh, measurements, actually a curvature that's kind of comparable to, to that of the, uh, the, the solar system, uh, but a really unique space. And then uh, it's an even more complex landscape uh, in terms of exactly what kind of tests that we're applying, what, what aspects uh, of general relativity are we testing. Okay, this figure uh, is, uh, uh, is missing uh, a, a part of its uh, graphic uh, as a result of PowerPoint transfer. Um, but uh, so what you have to, so 
this is a, a, a way of parametrizing the question of the deviations from the, uh, from the Kerr metric. And so here are the results for M87, depending on whether or not you believe the stellar mass measurement uh, or the gas mask measure, gas mass measurement uh, of, of the, uh, for the black hole. And you can see, you know, things agree pretty well for the stellar and not so well for gas. Um, the Sag star measurement uh, would be like this. Uh, and <laughs> it's actually kind of a comparable uncertainty to, uh, to M87 right now. Uh, but it doesn't have this, uh, it doesn't have this second outlier. And, uh, and so with improved observations, we believe we will be able to narrow that further and further. Okay, just a couple minutes here uh, left on, on what's next for the Event Horizon Telescope. We have so much data. Uh, those two images that I have shown you are from data sets that we took in 2017. Um, and we continue to take data and we continue to uh, improve uh, our array. We're adding new stations in. That's really important, in particular for, for SAGE star, where we're starved for UV coverage, for filling that visibility domain plane in order to be able to, uh, to make an image. Uh, and uh, we're also, in the, next, uh, in the next campaign, going to go to a, a higher observing frequency, so a 50% improvement uh, in, our, in our angular resolution, which will allow us to see sharper features uh, in these systems. Um, we do polarimetry. This is a, a map of, of M87, and we are at work on polarization uh, maps for, uh, for SAG A star. Uh, this constrains the magnetosphere, the magnetic field structure of the gas uh, around, the, uh, around the black hole. You see some of the models that are, that are considered here. And we're interested in the time domain, right? The basic feature that, that we see, of course, a ring of a particular diameter uh, should, uh, should remain constant over time. These are from some of these kind of proto measurements. But a lot of the details might change over time, and the degree to which they change over time would tell us about, uh, uh, about the astrophysics of the accretion and uh, allow us to explore that in a lot more detail. In the longer term, uh, we're very interested in whether or not we can constrain spin uh, of, the, uh, of these systems. There are a number of different uh, methods for, for doing that. None of them are you know, yet, yet ready to, to produce results, but I think over time we, we have some potential there. And then in the very long term, uh, there is a chance to see what is, I, I think, a, a really amazing effect to, to think about, which is that, so I, I told you at the beginning, right, the, the photons we're seeing, the ring that we're seeing is because light is bent by the mass of the black hole. And, and that's right, but what's, a, what's amazing is that you can actually have a situation where a photon orbits around the black hole and then comes out to you. And it, it turns out that the, the ring image is actually composed of, of a set of nested, uh, exponentially smaller and smaller rings uh, that are that are consist of of photons that are doing more and more orbits uh, uh, around the around the black hole. Now we probably can't do this measurement from the ground. We can't. the The Earth's diameter is a limitation that we can't overcome to see these nested rings. So we got to go to space. We got to put a we got to put a radio telescope on space, and uh, and send it out to really large uh, really large distances, really large radii from the Earth and synthesize uh, a, a telescope that's as large as the, the lunar diameter, for instance. Uh, it's a long-term vision, uh, it's a real challenge, uh, but incredibly exciting, and it opens up a, a number of really interesting tests uh, of, of the physics of black holes. There's a lot of great technology that's involved in this. Uh, we're continuing to develop that. We're looking at new sites, uh, improving the... Uh, the, the very sensitive receivers that we use and the digital technology, and of course, thinking about things like going into space. So let me end here. Um, I, I just wanna, I, I, wanna, I wanna emphasize a few things about what I think we have learned. And I think the most important thing uh, 
that we have learned from this is that at the base of, of those, all these systems that are driving powerful outflows and also sitting in quiescent galaxies like the Milky Way, all those, black, all those systems, there is a black hole sitting there at the base. And we have now a sample of two, uh, very different uh, kinds of systems. M87 drives a big jet, Sag A star does almost nothing. In both cases, uh, it's almost identical. And I think that is, a, that is, that is probably the most profound aspect uh, uh, of this result. Um, we're testing general relativity over three orders of magnitude and mass between these two different systems, and, uh, and that fits into this broader parameter space that, that tests it over many, many orders of magnitude. And we're doing precision measurements of accretion and jet physics. How do jets get launched? How does gas flow into black holes? How do black holes acquire mass? Uh, and so there's a whole host of things that we're going to do in the future, but I think I've said all of that. So thank you very much for your time uh, and, and your attention.